From Hong Kong, Chicago and the city of Stoke-on-Trent, this is the Classic Lenses Podcast. Hello and welcome to episode 99. My name is Simon Forster and I'm joined by Johnny Sisson and Perry G. Hello, Johnny. Hello. And hello, Perry. Hello. You said that intro with such authority. <laughs> I did. I, I, I threw myself into that. <laughs> 99 episodes worth of practice and you're almost there, Simon. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Uh, 100 is just around the corner and we, we have that special one lined up with uh, Jason Lane. Um, who I really need to talk to just to make sure he still wants to do it. Uh, <laughs> that's that's planning for you, isn't it? So, uh, so Jason, if you if you're listening to this before I've actually made contact with you, um, we still want to do it. Okay. Um, right. So, uh, you guys had a good Christmas. Yeah. Yeah. It was nice. Good. Good. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's let's go straight into what we're going to be doing this week um, because with literally minutes worth of planning uh, we've decided to make this an award show uh, to round out 2019 um, so this is the classic lenses podcast lenses of the year awards podcast number 99 <laughs> um so yeah um have we actually decided why we're doing this from this point onwards perry because this was sort of your idea uh, well, we decided that we were going to keep it fairly open-ended because, you know, I originally thought about it as the lenses that we've either used the most or enjoyed the most or uh, gotten the best results out of. Um, but the things that would make a lens sort of a highlight of the year differ from person to person. So Johnny rightly pointed out that we should pretty much make our own criteria uh for these awards and so the original idea was to pick one lens uh as our lens of the year and then johnny said no i can't do that it has to be three um sort of a countdown and runners up and then simon came back and said okay it can't be three it's five because i've got three winners and two <laughs> runners up uh so that's what we're doing i think you know, it's, it's very much in the spirit of an end of year uh, award, whether it's the Oscars or an end of season sporting award. Uh, so I think we'll we'll sort of explain our conception of the awards as we explain our winners is probably the best way to go. That makes sense. It does make sense. So, uh, Perry, do you want to? Do, how many awards have you got to give out tonight? Uh, well, I had two, and that's expanded to five after you uh, <laughs> after you mentioned it. So I, I have two special mentions and three award winners in different categories. Okay, so I, I just I, I have two proper awards and a special award, and have uh, a winner and a runners up in two of them. And obviously, the special award just has one. Good so, God, you guys! I yeah. you did way more planning than I did. <laughs> <laughs> it's because when you were asleep, Simon was like, I have five. And I was like, oh, I need to have five as well. <laughs> well if, if you need to add to your awards as you go along, Johnny, we won't mind. Because nobody no, okay, them. thank you. Fair enough. Right. Okay, well, seeing that Perry seems to have more awards than anybody now. Uh, yeah. Oh, you have the most. No, no, I have three, I have three categories with... with yes. Two two things in each. Well, two things in two and one in one. So that's yeah, I have total. This, I have five in total as well. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, you can still go first. So, so now, okay. Perry, um, tell us about your first award. Okay, so uh, my awards are very much modeled on sporting awards. So just to break down my categories, I've got a special mention. Uh, I've got a sports personality of the year award for uh, character. I'll explain all of these in more detail, but I've also got a Rookie of the Year a Partnership Award and then an MVP, you know, the lens of the year. So I'll start with my special mention. You know, in the world of sport, the athletes and the managers are always the star, but there's always the supporting cast that aren't actually on the field uh, who enrich the game, right? It's everything from your Tottenham Hotspur ball boy to the Stoke City towel uh, to... <laughs> the Chicago Cubs and their W flag, right? These things that are not actually part of the sport, but they very much are. Uh, so this is my award for non-rangefinder lens of the year. Oh my God, Barry. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I looked at my list and I was like, oh, there's a trend here. But you know what I did originally? I went through my Instagram and I looked at the pictures that I posted and what lenses I made from them. 
And there's one picture on my entire Instagram feed that was not made with a rangefinder lens. And it was done wow. with a point and shoot. Um, so I think, I think you know, my, my preference for shooting is very much clear. Uh, oh, so you, are you saying you, you didn't put any of your Konica 40 mil shots onto your Instagram account? What Konica? Oh, that <laughs> <laughs> the lens we gave away? Yeah. No. No, I did not. <laughs> Okay. Okay. All right. Um, so this is a lens that I don't use very well. I don't upload images from it because it lives on my Fuji XT10 uh, most of the time, and I use it for a casual shooting because it fits so well. Um, and that is the uh, Olympus Pen F 38 millimeter f 1.8 is Ooh. my special mention of the year. Yeah. Um, wow. And the <laughs> I know you sound surprised because I never talk about this lens. Yeah. Um, but it is the only pen F lens I own at the moment. So that that's going to change soon, I think. Uh, but the only reason I don't carry it around more is because most of my lenses are other mounts. And so it I like to sort of double up on adapters. So this lens, for the most part, when I'm not traveling or something or not using my X-T10, it just lives on that camera. Um, and I use it for the same way, sort of, Johnny, that you use your X100. Yeah. You know, your kind of casual shots. It, it It's it's one of the few Olympus Pen F lenses that covers full frame. Uh, so sometimes I will stick it on my Sony for a bit more character. But it's just the perfect size for a Fuji. It handles pretty well. And, and it, it, it resolves really well um, on that sensor with a little bit of swirl in the edges, too, for character. So I, I like everything about it on that body. But I don't have a Pen F camera at the moment. So there's literally nothing else that I use this lens on. But of my non rangefinder lenses, it gets the most action. Hmm. It's a it's a nice lens. I've oh. used used them uh, a couple couple of times, and in, in, and as you say, it just covers uh, full frame as well. So you you do get a, a great look with that lens. So uh, yeah, it's a good lens. Yeah, very nice. I, I just like how shocked Johnny sound. <laughs> <laughs> the very unexpected. Yes. But it, hey, it's it's the non rangefinder lens I use the most. Um, I just wouldn't post any results with it because it's usually like pictures of my cat or random snapshots around town or pictures of like family and friends at dinner. Um, so it it really excels at the you know digital camera. Stick it in the bag and click 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 click. All right, that's all right. Very nice. My special mention award. So, do you, what? What's your what's your first proper award? to give away because we also have a trophy as well to give which uh, I'll, I'll let you introduce wait there's a trophy we have a trophy yeah Good proper, God. Award, proper awards have trophies when did you guys do all this when did all this happen i woke up i went to bed late i woke up and you guys have got awards already well when simon wakes up it's about 2 p.m my time <laughs> Uh, so that gives us like a good eight hours before you're up for the podcast. To I didn't even go back through the chat and see if you guys were conspiring <laughs> on this yet i had no idea <laughs> Yeah, Simon 3D printed a bunch of trophies, but now he's yeah, to right. More. Simon's already <laughs> printed the trophies. <laughs> All right, I'm uh, going to do that now. <laughs> so, do you want me to keep going and just run through the whole list, or bounce yeah, back and forth? I, I think so. We'll we'll go through your awards first. Okay. I think. I think. Okay, so. that makes yeah. way more sense uh, in terms of the categories. Okay, so next, um, this is my uh, inspired by the BBC Sport Personality of the Year award. Um, so this is the lens whose character I've enjoyed most. Uh, so it's a character Ooh. lens. It's a lens that, I, yeah, you know, it hasn't necessarily had the best year in terms of uh, usage or stats or, you know, results. Um, but when I want character, I, I definitely reach for it. There were a couple of candidates in this category. Uh, they're almost all 50 millimeter lenses. Uh, but... I keep coming back to the same one. It's one I mentioned on uh, the episode when I came on to do Desert Island. And it's the Canon 50mm f1.5 LTM. Ah. Uh, yeah. It's my favorite uh, vintage sonar lens. I still maintain that I like it much better than uh, the Nikkor 51.4 or all the others. Uh, and I particularly like shooting this lens in color. And... There's something about its results in color that I just I just always find so satisfying and so pleasing. I very very rarely shoot this lens in black and white, which which may not be which, you know I might be missing a trick with that. But I just love everything about this lens. It's small. 
Uh, it has a lot of heft to it, so it feels you know, like a really well-made lens. My copy is perfectly damped in its focus. Um, and I, I, I just adore, I adore this lens. So, but I only grab it for fairly close up shots um, because it's not a lens that I would use for general purpose. It's not great at infinity, uh, but that's not really what I think sonar lenses excel at anyway. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I also know that Robbie J., uh, has purchased one of these um, due to my gushing about it, and he seems to be having a good time with it too. Yeah, nice, excellent. So that's the the first the first call of the night goes to the Canon fifty millimeter f one point five LTM. Uh, okay, so Simon has just revealed the name of our award. Yes. Um, <laughs> so I was thinking you're not going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the, the, yes, the trophy, much like the Oscars, the, the trophy is called the Oscar. Uh, our trophy is called the Carl. So you can imagine it is a golden 3D printed uh, trophy shaped like Carl Havens. That wearing Simon mom is, jeans. Wearing Poss- mom jeans. Poss- possibly that, about to slip backwards into, into his pool with the pool cover still on. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, with that said, that's not actually a, uh, well, I guess, I guess Sport Personality of the Year is a, is a proper award, right? Okay, but on to the actual three proper winners. Oh, uh, I, I thought that was one of them. Oh, there no, that, I, I, I jumped ahead there. There you go. That, I, do I mean, sport, sport personality of the year is not a real award, right? It's more of a, we enjoyed having you here this year because you're fun. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> so that's, that's what this lens gets. All right. Okay, the three proper awards. The first one is Rookie of the Year. This is to the lens that has had the best debut this year, and there have been many, many debuts. Uh, you know, if you think to some of the classic sporting debuts with Wayne Rooney scoring that iconic goal for Everton against Arsenal, you know, those moments that you remember, uh, and they someone comes and makes their mark on history, um, that's what this award is for. So my Rookie of the Year award goes to a lens that I picked up relatively cheap. Um, <laughs> there were actually two candidates in this category, by the way. Uh, but the other one cost about 15 times more than this lens. Um, it's the one that Simon, uh, the one I got off Simon. So this one is the Fujinon uh, 50 millimeter or 5 centimeter f2.8 LTM. When I picked up this lens, I was not expecting much. Um, it was just a good price and in really good condition. But it's become my go-to 50 millimeter lens when I want something small and solid because it feels incredibly well built and robust. Um, Fuji only made a couple of lenses in LTM, and of the 50s, there's a 50 f2, which is substantially larger. Uh, and this this one is very 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 tiny. It's smaller than like a like a Sumicron, um, but that's because it's an f two point eight. The handling is out of this world. It has this sort of brass focus tab that's super smooth and super robust. And then the focus clicks are are quite you know the action is quite um, I don't know how to describe it. You know how some some aperture rings they're they're a little bit tight or they don't click into place really well. This one, there's just enough resistance that you don't change the aperture accidentally. But once it gets moving, it clicks to the next stop, like just like that. So, yeah, I've been really happy with this lens. It's it's sharp as hell. It's 3D pop is great. Um, but I think it's just like the joy of using a lens that feels this smooth and well built uh, that that gives it this award. Have you guys ever tried this lens? No, nope. No, I've never, I've never seen one in person. Okay, yeah. Uh, this is... I, I, it's not rare, but I think it's one of the more uncommon LTM lenses to find. And I think because the F2 version is... is it's a lot more expensive, but it's also more popular. Um, you often find these in pretty good shape because I don't think they get as much use as they deserve, but it's it's really good. I wow. shot a lot of the... Um, when I was shooting the, the protests at the Poly U and the siege of the Polytechnic University near my place, uh, this lens and the uh, and one other lens, which I'm not going to mention right now because it's also an award winner, were uh, were my most used lenses. 
The only annoying thing is like a lot of vintage LTM lenses, it has 40.5 millimeter filter threads. And uh, I was I was out shopping with Mike Epstein and another friend the other day, and we were looking for filters. And it seems like the two filter sizes that I need right now, 40.5 and 49, are just out of uh, out of stock all over Hong Kong. Really? Yeah, for for yellow and red. Oh wow. Yeah, I know it's it's relatively common, but they just they just seem to be sold out everywhere at the moment. So yeah, I don't know. Maybe dealers are going to restock, or I'm just too lazy to look online. But yeah, great lens. <laughs> if you get a chance to pick one up, um, I highly recommend it. So that's rookie of the year. Okay. Wow. Now we get into the two big awards. Uh, the first one is a partnership. Um, this is my best camera and lens combo. You know, inspired again by the world of sport, there are some athletes who on their own are great, but are part of an unbreakable partnership. This is your your Chavi and Iniesta, your, your Navratilova and Shriver, yeah, your Jordan and Pippen, uh, Peter Crouch and Jermaine Defoe, right? And, and an inseparable combo uh, that took the world by storm. Uh, and this is the only camera I'm going to mention, but really, there could only be one. Uh, there could only be one candidate in this category, and that is my Hasselblad X-Pan and the 45 millimeter uh, f4 lens that I have with it. Mm. I-, I shot this all year, and every single time I shoot it, it brings a smile to my face. And it's this the one camera lens combo that I have never gotten sick of. And I don't think I can get sick of this because it's just so satisfying. You know, it makes yeah. you... I-, I was having an interesting chat with uh, Mike Epstein the other day after we were shooting because... I was telling him that when I bring the X-Pan up to my eye and I look through the viewfinder, it doesn't feel like I'm shooting in an unusual format. It just, it turns the world pano. And it's a very, very natural way of seeing. And for him, um, he actually sees that as that as a negative because he prefers to shoot weirder formats. So he really likes six by six because it forces him to kind of look through the camera and, you know, he shoots stuff like pinhole and large format and all kinds of, of wacky formats. So he, he likes it when a camera forces you to see the world its way. But that, isn't uh, that really saying the same thing, though? Uh, yes, I think so to a certain degree. But to me, looking through the X-Pan viewfinder, it doesn't feel like I'm I'm sort of conforming to it. It feels yeah. like... It's a perfect match. Like when I bring up the viewfinder, it's like this is the way that I want to see and compose the world most of the time. Yeah. And even when I shoot 35 millimeter film, I would say the vast majority of my horizontal shots, I crop down to 16 by nine just to chop off a bit of the top and bottom. Um, that isn't doing anything. So it's just it's such a natural way of seeing. And yeah. you know, you you guys have been dicking around with all kinds of pano cameras this year. Uh this is the and this is the ultimate. I'm, I'm going to maintain that. Yeah. Well, you, uh, I was just going to say you say you say dicking around with, but you've been dicking around with one as well, haven't you? This weekend. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, I have. I, I guess I should talk about that. Um, oh, trust Simon that when I'm talking about giving the X Pan an award, he wants to bring up his silly Soviet <laughs> true camera. Too right. Um, proper, proper panorama camera. So. Yes, Mike Epstein and another friend uh, and I went to an abandoned village in Hong Kong uh, on Sunday, I think, maybe Saturday. Um, And I brought along, he brought three cameras. He brought a pinhole camera, a Leica M3 and a Zeiss Icon ZM. Um, I brought a medium format Bronica S2, uh, my Leica 3F with my new 3.5 Elmar and a brand spanking new to me, uh, black paint hood, not hood, um, yellow filter and the horizon 202, (laughs) uh, (laughs) which I brought because of its wide sweeping lens. I figured there would be times when I would want to stick it on a tripod and basically capture. I knew that we were going to be inside. Shoot. Uh, that was a lens. Don't worry about it. <laughs> um, the I, I knew that we would be inside abandoned houses, so I figured getting the kind of you know ultra sweeping 
uh, view would let me sort of capture the entire inside from a tight space. So that that was the rationale originally uh, from bringing the horizon. And, you know, it did a really good job. I finally figured out how to load the thing properly and efficiently, um, which, you know, takes a lot of the irritation out. And it's so wide that there were times where Mike was standing next to me, like to my left. And I would say, dude, you're in my frame. <laughs> and he would have to go and stand behind me. But the ultimate coup de grace uh, of the horizon was we did finally try my, uh, you know, the moment I got this camera, the one shot I wanted to try was to have someone run across the frame um, while the lens was taking the picture. So we took two or three pictures of uh, both him and, and, and myself running across the horizon frame as the lens was swinging. Uh, I showed you guys a video of us doing that, which, yeah. <laughs> the, vi- the video is is amazing. And uh, you, I've, I'm going to appeal to to Mike Epstein here to uh, give us permission to release it and put it onto our, our YouTube channel because it's brilliant. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. He, he just messaged. He's cool with that. Oh, that's good. We'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll do that. We'll do that later. But he, he says there's one of me running across the frame as well that he insists goes up too because he's pushing the shutter there. So I'll, I'll, send, I'll send that to you guys. Yeah. I'm just, just, just wondering if, if Mike's familiar with um, a British TV comedy from uh, the early 80s called The Young Ones um, because the, his, his run across the frame was straight out of, um, straight out of The Young Ones and Rick Mail. <laughs> um, I, I, what, what character? I can't remember the name of his character now in the Young Ones, but uh, um, anybody that's familiar with the Young Ones and the character that Rick Mail played in it will, uh, will recognise um, his his run and how he does it uh, immediately. Well, he's he's also he's also got his middle fingers up while he's doing that. I don't know if you could tell from the resolution no, of the video. That, that, no, that's exactly <laughs> that's what oh, I'm saying, reminiscent. Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> how, that's how Rick, Rick's character would definitely do it. It's the run, everything is ex- exactly as uh, as Rick would have done it in the young ones. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. That uh, I will ask him that, or or he'll hear this and and confirm. Um, yeah, the vi- the video of me doing it, he describes as a uh, a really shitty Swan Lake. <laughs> <laughs> going across the frame so i'll show you guys that anyway that, that that was a lot of fun um it was more of a proof of concept because the photos did not come out um they're basically on each frame on the very very end of the image on the right hand side of the frame you can see a, a, a trail like a blurry trail of the person running so i, I was trying to figure out why that is only appearing at the end of the frame and what I need to do next time to fix that. Because I'm totally doing this again. It, it, and you guys should try it. It's a hell of a lot of fun. Hmm. Um, so the only thing I can think of is either we need to run slower because the coverage of the lens is you know, not corresponding perfectly with the sound of the swing uh, yeah. in terms of pace. Or uh, I guess the thing to do would be to have the subject hold a flashlight or to fire flashes constantly so you can see the, you know, because it may, it may just be that the, there's not enough light as you're moving across the frame to create a, a moving image, right? Yeah. yeah. So I don't know if you guys have well, any suggestions well, on how to well, do, do that thing, correctly. I, I guess the other part is, though, you, you've got the still part of the image is going to get more exposure to the film than, yes. than the bit where the person's running across. So therefore, you'll never see the person as well as you'll see what's behind the person. Right. Exactly. So so the reason why I think on the final image, um, one reason I suspect we you might see the person blurring at the very, very end of the frame is just that we know when, when to stop, and so we slow down towards the end of our run. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Which suggests to me that, I don't know, th- th- there must be a way of running to do that across the whole frame. Right. Or just use a flash, which is probably the easiest. Yeah. I, yeah, I think you need... Like it's it's like if you look at uh, time exposure shots, where yeah. th- they've got people, you know, walking or something, and you you see the whole series of movement. It's done with a strobe because it freezes their right. Yeah. So yeah. and it also it's gonna illuminate brighter than the background because the you figure if the light is the same on the subject and the background. You're just going to see the blur. Just, I mean, like you would on yeah. a, a street photography shot. If you do a street photo shot at, you know, with an ND filter for, 
a second or two seconds, the people all disappear. Same yeah, yeah, it's, concept. Yeah. So obviously, you need a strobe, and he needs to be wearing a suit, an LED suit, covered in little LED lights. Right, so because you moving. The difference between that and a traditional long exposure is because the lens is moving. I, I thought of it as almost like panning the subject. Yeah. Right. Um, so I wasn't sure how much sharpness, if anything, you'd get. But I guess you're right that you're never going to get as much exposure as the background, even if the subject is moving perfectly in line with the lens. Right. Because it's exposing right. different parts of the film. Yeah. Yeah. It's not right. exposing the same part of the film. Yeah, it's that right. And it's only exposing what one piece of the film for a given amount of time. Still. That makes sense. That's yeah. what I hadn't factored in. Ah, oh, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Right, 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 right. So it's sweeping. It, I don't know what the exposure, what was the exposure time set at? Uh, well, the swing itself lasts about five seconds, but the exposure yeah. was, um, it was either an eighth of quarter or half a second. Right. So each, each little section of film is getting essentially that much exposure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right, I'm going to do this again. I mean, Simon, you have much better access to subjects to do this. You can get your kids or your dog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, Mike can run like Mick Mail. So that's true. That, that, that just wins. That's yeah. true. Oh, it, it's also better done um, in scenes where you're not too far away or the background isn't too far away. Uh, just because, like, your subject would have to run way too far. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. The further they get, you know, you, you, the further they get, like by f- the the distance they have to run across the frame, it like increases exponentially because of how wide that horizon is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> my award winner is the X Pan, and we just spent a, a couple minutes talking about <laughs> the Horizon Two Hundred Two. Good so, work, Simon. Good work. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that hijacking. That's it. <laughs> All right, and then finally, uh, the MVP, the player of the year. Uh, this is probably not going to be a surprise. There were only two candidates, but this is the the Lionel Messi, the Wayne Gretzky, Michael Jordan Award for greatness. Um, and, and, you know, my world of lenses is very much like the world of football. You got Messi and Ronaldo, two dominant players who are vying for top spot. One lens is clearly the most talented and greatest of all time. Uh, your Lionel Messi lens, but it does not win this year. That's the 35 Biogon. Uh, instead, this year you have the most complete player uh, as the winner. Uh, and this is the lens that I've made the most images with, uh, the lens that I trust the most, that I use the most because it's the most versatile. And that's, of course, uh, my 35 millimeter Summicron version 4. I mean, what can I say? It's I just I just use this lens more than any other. Its handling is perfect. Uh, it's optically not my favorite, but it's good enough in every department. And it's tiny, which is super important to me. It's light. Uh, it's f two, and that extra stop of speed has been very very valuable uh, yeah. because I'm shooting more and more in that little period of time where the light starts to change and starts to dim. Um, so especially with sort of four hundred speed or film pushed eight hundred. I, I do appreciate that extra stop quite a bit. And I mean, it's the, it's, it's a camera. It, sorry, it's a lens that works well on every single camera I have that has a like M mount. Yeah, there it is. Lens of the year, 35 millimeter Summicron. It, if, if you made me choose one lens to keep for the rest of my life and I couldn't use anything else, give me this lens and I'd be happy. Wow. Yeah. Very nice. Go. Those are my Carl winners. Cool, cool. Um, I guess we've got nothing to add about about the uh, the, the Summicron forty five uh, thirty five there, uh, Johnny. No, I mean that's, I think that's great. I can I can certainly understand that. And uh, well, when I get to, when I get to, when I get to my picks, there there may be some similarities here. Ah, Ooh. okay. Well, in that case, um, better go on to my awards that aren't to LTM lenses. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, my my first category uh, isn't even going to be a lens at all. So I'm going to do a camera of the year. Um, Ooh. But uh, there's going to be a runner-up. Uh, my runner-up camera of the year, um, which is largely responsible for me um, giving an element of credit 
to test our lenses on 35 millimeter cameras oh. and that is the contacts rx not the rx no no the ax no, the fatty yeah the fat boy yeah it's big boned it's big boned um <laughs> And uh, yeah, so the, the Contax AX is my runner-up of camera of the year uh, because I used it earlier on this year and I used it with the 45mm Tessar uh, Contax Yashica uh, lens, uh, so that's a 2.8. And it, it's a pancake lens and it's tiny. Um, but it, it, and it look, just looks stupid on that camera because that camera is, is possibly the largest conventional 35mm camera you can buy, I think. Um, yeah, it's it's enormous, and that's because it's mm -hmm. got this internal mechanism that will actually focus, uh, autofocus, a manual focus lens by uh, moving the body forwards and backwards, or at least the the film plane forwards and backwards. So it's a it's a really neat uh, solution, and we talked about it at length, or rather, um, <laughs> Perry and I talked about contacts cameras at length, and Johnny <laughs> went off to do the uh, washing up and uh, dusted the house while while we carried on talking about them. Um, so uh so yeah that's that's my runner up for for my camera of the year great camera um but um my call for camera of the year uh, goes to the horizon 202 Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> excellent and um and yeah i guess, i guess we won't talk too much about it since we've already covered that with the um with the x pan 40 millimeter award that went earlier <laughs> um and uh, but it's uh, it's just been a revelation for me um uh, it, it's one of those cameras that you you look through the viewfinder which gives an approximation of what you're going to get it certainly doesn't tell you what you're going to get because it just it looks good when you first look through it it's because the world looks incredibly wide as if like you it's weird actually because the the world you see you see what you see with your eyes but you then look at it through the viewfinder which is which is curtailing your angle of view but you seem to see wider than you would do when you haven't got the camera in front of your face it's a it's a it's a weird thing um because you, because you just just don't expect to see a viewfinder that can actually encompass that much of what's in front of you yeah um, so so that's the first thing that hits you and then when you've actually got the photographs developed and you're looking in, looking at them and i've said this many times it, it just makes ordinary things look extraordinary um so you can you can go out and take photographs of things that you've taken many times before or scenes that you've seen and you've just not bothered with and just take photographs and they just make you smile they might not actually be um particularly good photographs but they you, they just show you a world in a in a different way and I really like that camera for that, and I think it's, I think it's like the be the best pieces of equipment. I find it's 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 inspirational because it gives you something different and it gives you a reason to go out and do something. So, uh, my camera of the year is the Horizon Two Hundred Two. I mean, everything you said about the Horizon, apart from the crazy width and distortion, is pretty much why I picked the X Pan as well, right? It's that that joy. So, hey, speaking of the X Pan, since you gave the Horizon your your award. Um, I tried the 30 millimeter X pan lens, which is crazy wide. In a, I tried it in a shop, and I hate to admit it, but when I was trying the lens, I, I actually said to the shopkeeper, "You know, I think I'd rather use the Horizon 202 than this, <laughs> than, than this lens on my X pan because you have to use an external finder, and it's a, and and it has a bubble, so it's a pretty similar experience ultimately." Well, wow. yeah, I, th I think there's, there's there's definitely a point of difference, isn't it, between the the and we've again we've touched upon this before. You're you're getting that that uh, cropped look with the with the X pan without the, the the distortion, so you're getting that cinematic yeah. look, and I think that's a a very distinctive and desirable look for when when you actually want to to to, to have that. Uh, whereas you know I I view the uh, the horizon is a, is, a, is a true panorama because it, it it sort of looks almost looks around corners, doesn't it? Um, yeah. So that that's that's my my take on the two. So it's, they're it's, very it's, different. They they are they are. I mean, I, I've I've got to say, I I, I quite fancy an X pan if I had the opportunity to have one, especially with that forty <laughs> mil lens. Um, but I'm very very happy with my horizon. I'm surprised you didn't pick your Sony, Simon. Uh, well, I could have done, but I've hardly used it this year. It seems I, I used it the first half of this year. Uh, my uh, my A seven two, which I still like and I still use. Um, 
but uh, but no, it's uh, it's it's. The, I've had it for five years, mm. you know. So you know, it's uh, it's it's things that have that are shiny and new that have come into my life, which have uh, which I'm looking at at this moment, at least anyway. Although I do have a another award with for something I've had for a while. So, so just to wrap that thought up, uh, I've heard from at least three people who listen to this podcast, um, as well as Ben Reynolds, who posted this in our Facebook group. Uh, to tell me that they they either laughed out loud or audibly <laughs> like gasped when you named the Sony A7R4 as your uh, <laughs> your inobtainium camera last last week, just as a follow up. <laughs> uh, I've got to say my 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 favorite moment of uh, of that podcast was uh, when when. Uh, there was there was silence uh, from Johnny when I I said that, that I'll go for a Canon uh, a Canon <laughs> F1 is my pick and uh, to which uh, which brought out swearing on on Johnny's part of all the cameras I could have picked I went for that, one. Yeah, so, uh, that was uh, I'd, I'd love that last week but, uh, but no I mean I don't I don't I'm just thinking I'm, these awards are for things that I own. Um, in my opinion, anyway, we've, oh, yeah. not, we've, we've not gone through uh, uh, the criteria, so uh, I wasn't going to give it to something I don't don't have or have not used. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Anyway, so that's uh, that's uh, my first call goes to uh, the Helios two hundred two for camera of the year. Um, my next award uh, is because I'm going to do lens of, my lens of the year last. Uh, my next award is the Lifetime Achievement Award. Ooh, yeah. And I've, I've, you know, the inaugural Lifetime Achievement Award, which I think has to go, in, in certainly in my case, uh, to my Carl Zeiss 50mm f1.4 planar on contact Yashica mount. Mm -hmm. It's been with me since 1988, and I still love it. It's still the reference lens that, all other lenses are judged against in terms of handling. Does it handle as well as that lens? Does, is the focus action as nice as that lens? Does the, does the aperture ring turn in such a precise and measured way? Um, it's as much about the handling as, as it is about the, the results. So there are lenses out there that can beat that lens in almost every single area. Um, and some of it can, some lenses can pretty much equal it or better it in, in most areas. Um, but I don't care because it does everything I wanted to do. I know exactly what it's going to do. I know its limitations. I know its strengths. And I know that it just works in the way that I'm going to be very, very happy with and very, very comfortable with. So whenever it, it, I need a lens that's 50 millimeters and needs to be quite fast or has the potential I want it to be quite quick and it's going to go onto a, either an SLR camera or, or adapt it to digital. That's the lens I will take that I know that I will come away with the best chance of getting the shot. So uh, I love that lens. It's brilliant. Have you, have you ever had to get it serviced? Never. Oh man. So you've had that lens for almost exactly as long as I've been alive. So <laughs> <laughs> It sounds like it's in a lot better shape than I am. <laughs> yeah, it's and it, it 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 looks pretty new now. Um, and it was used when I bought it. I, I couldn't afford to buy a new one uh, back in Ooh. 1988. It was so it was, it was second hand. Um, and it's I've I've used other lens other 50s, and, and it's it's got to be a case of my lens just works really really well. I've had I've handled other uh, contact Yashica lenses, uh, Zeiss lenses that don't quite work as well as that one although interesting when i it went into hibernation for about 20 years and when i first got it back out thinking oh i can put this onto my olympus em1 uh it had a it had a notch in it uh in the in the focus action i was thinking oh that's not good and it's just how the, the lens had just hadn't moved for a long time and the mm. grease had settled in, in, a, in a particular mm -hmm. place I yeah that's what had happened and uh, that, and it had a tight spot uh, but just after you know a relatively small period of time of use it just disappeared and it's and it works just as well as it did 30 years ago so it's a wonderful lens yeah that's a great choice i, mean, yeah. I have that lens yeah. too it's my it's my favorite slr 50 millimeter lens but that is a great point you know um for old cameras and old lenses sometimes if they're a little bit sticky all you got to do is use them and work them um yeah. and that just gets rid of it's like it's like working out you know gets rid of any of those kinks. Yeah. 
doesn't, doesn't necessarily apply to Soviet lenses, of course, with uh, with <laughs> ba- bacon fat or lack of yeah. bacon fat. Right, right. Um, so if, you know, if if you've got a, a stiff Soviet lens, it, it's going to stay that way until you get it cleaned out. So uh, so there we go. So um, yeah, that's my lifetime achievement uh, award. So that call goes to the Colzeiss fifty millimeter f one point four planar on contact Yashica mount. Um, so finally, my lens of the year. Um, my runner-up is going to be the Snyder Kurtigon 35mm f4 PA, uh, which is a perspective control lens or a shift lens uh, mm. that I bought this year. In fact, I ended up buying two within a week of each other, it just just the way that it happened. And uh, one was on Leica R mount, which is which is now gone. Ironically, that was actually slightly sharper um, than the. Uh, M42 version that I kept, but I kept the M42 version because simply because it's just it's easier to adapt and to put onto uh, a tilt adapter. So I've actually now turned that into a into a shift tilt a shift tilt lens. Oh, cool! Um, not that I've actually used it that way yet, um, but the the good thing is if anybody actually wants to use uh, a, sh- a a tilt adapter. Um, it's you do need a bit of extra coverage as in the image circle needs to be larger than something that will just cover the size of a full frame sensor or or negative and of course if you get a, a shift lens it's designed to have a larger image circle uh, mm-hmm. because you you need to move it up by maybe i don't know what the travel is maybe 10 centimeters uh, not 10 centimeters 10 millimeters in fact i'm going to try and measure it. i've got it in front of me Let's see. Um, yeah, it looks like it, it shifts about about eight millimeters at a, at a guess, and um, which means that the image circle is still covering it, even though I've, it actually gets moved up or down or left or right um, by eight to ten millimeters. And the same will also apply on the shift. Oh, sorry, yeah, uh, on the tilt. Sorry, uh, because when you actually tilt a lens, you're you're moving. Uh, the the circle uh, the projected image circle is, is is moving, and if if it, again if it is only just covering uh, the the size of the sensor or the film, then you're going to get um, vignetting on the top or bottom, depending which way you actually turn in the lens. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. If it only just covers it, whereas again with this because it has that lot, it's designed to have a larger image circle than the, the, than that's necessary. Um, it won't you won't get any vignetting and it's designed to cope with it so also because the other problem is of course you may have a lens that's got more coverage at the edges uh, than than strictly necessary but as perry was talking earlier with the with the pen lens it's like the 38 1.8 uh that will cover full frame just but it go, it's very swirly at the edges and it's not swirly because that's how olympus wanted to do it it was a case of they just didn't need to do that bit because that was never going to be shown on a on a half frame camera so they didn't have to correct for that um so so yeah so having an image circle that will cover more than full frame is is only part of what you're after when you actually want to tilt or you want to shift so using a perspective control lens you've got you can use it to its fullest extent in all directions and it is going to give you less distortion and less uh uh, fewer artifacts in the image so uh, that's that's my runner-up lens you know you know that lens will actually cover an x-pan negative all oh, right interesting. Uh, there there are people who use uh that lens or more popular is the nikkor 35 2.8 uh pc mm. lens mm. um or even the nikkor 28 which has a little bit of black corners but but not yeah. too bad um there are adapters where you can adapt those to x-pan and use them as a scale focused ultra wide which is oh super that's cool. crazy I didn't know they made yeah. adapters. Oh, wow, that's cool. Yeah, the adapters are not expensive. They're like ten bucks, and I oh totally want to. I totally want to do that with a Nikkor uh, thirty-five two point eight tilt shift, because like the X Pan yeah. thirty millimeter lens is, uh, it's slower and it's also ridiculously expensive. Um, whereas the PC, you know, scale focus it thirty-five pretty much is the whole viewfinder. Yeah, yeah I think Hamish perfect. has done that. Actually, I think there's an article on 35 MMC um, where where when Hamish had an X Pan, he put a tilt or one of his writers put a tilt shift Nikkor on it. Yeah, yeah, uh, I think it, I think you're right. Yeah, yeah, I think that was a 35 as well. I think. Yeah, I better go get that lens before price starts going up. <laughs> 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 well, one of the things about the about the Snyder is it's small. 
it's it's much smaller than the than the Nichols. Uh, yeah, fair, yeah. To be fair, though, it's an F four. It's not two point eight. Um, but that's that's. I mean, I like my fast lenses, but being an F four has not put put me off this lens at all because I've been finding that I've. I, I don't. I don't feel I'm going to be using it in a way that I need that extra speed. Because the chances are, most of the time, I'm going to be stopped down with this. Because it's going to be outside, and it's mm-hmm. going to be. I don't know. Perhaps doing architectural, or it's going to be set back. I don't know. It doesn't. It doesn't strike. It doesn't seem to be any kind of a handicap. And this is the first. And it's it's, it's a good lens in its own right. Let alone the fact that it's got the the party trick of being a shift lens. But it's actually a lens I'm, that has actually kept my flectagon off my camera when I've needed a thirty five millimeter lens. So mm. I think that's that's pretty high praise because I've always I've really rated my particular copy of my flectagon, which is a particularly good one. Um, yet yeah, I'm. I'll just put this on because I think, well, it gives me a little bit more versatility if I actually want to do something and straighten up some, some converging verticals and things. Hey, question. How, how is the M42 version uh, significantly cheaper than the Leica R version? Um, Cause that lens costs a lot more than the Nikkor. Yeah. I don't, to be honest, I don't know. Um, I mean, I've got them both at a good price, uh, but the, okay. The Leica R, oh, I sold that 300 and something pounds. I can't remember how much I actually sold that for recently. Yeah, because you can get the Nikkor for less than 1,500 pounds, but, you know, you, you, sorry, 150 pounds. Um, but you're, when you mention that it's much smaller, that's actually really attractive. Mm. Um, and if I'm just thinking about adapting it to the X-Pan, if I'm going to be using it as scale focus, like 2.8 is pretty useless anyway. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, that would make a lot of sense. Was oh, that might be the way to go. Yeah, I've got, I've got a. That's my. Uh, here we go. So that'll cover GFX easily. Well, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean the actual lens itself is smaller than a than a pentac- uh, than a, a flectagon. Oh, actually, oh, ah, the, no, it's not. It, it yeah, it's one of those things. It, the the bulk of the lens is is relatively small, but there's there's a bit of extension at the back of it uh, that just makes it longer and stick out a little bit further. It's a, it's a bit of an odd looking lens actually, um, but yeah, overall it's a, yeah it's a it's a it's a tidy sized lens really. Sweet. Hmm. Okay, so uh, let's talk about my my lens of the year. Um, and that's going to go to, uh, and there is no proper name for this lens, um, so I'm going to give it. I'll give it its full a fuller version of what it what it is, and that's the the Helios Cyclop, hundred millimeter f two. What? Uh, yes. <laughs> Have you used it? Have you used that lens this year? <laughs> We've spoke about this lens at length on the podcast. <laughs> yeah, for your flower, sh- your one well flower done, photo. Well done, Perry. You were you were listening. <laughs> that, yeah, that that's good. This this was the was, this was the lens that that really set, settled a, 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 a dilemma that I had about you know whether or not flower photographs or flower photography and you know uh, niche photography in general. Um, where that sits in the big scheme of things and it sits wherever you want it to sit it's as simple as that if you want to go out and take flowers take flowers and, and don't let people put be say well you you, know, you need to have people in a photograph or you need to do this or you need to do that you do whatever you want to do and this was this was the lens that that um, allowed me to think that way because it I was I was out with this lens just testing it and I had a few other lenses with me, and I thought, well, I'm going to take this picture of this 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 flower where where I was at, and the whichever lens I was using at the time was a particularly good lens. I can't remember what it was, um, but I really didn't like what was going on in the background. It was it was just dull. It was boring, and it was doing a good enough job of, of what it was doing. But I then thought, okay, let's let's put this let's try this hundred mil lens from a, a a night vision scope with an M42 thread on it. And this is the, the it's the lesser known one because there's there's the the main cyclop and the best known cyclop is the eighty five millimeter f one point five uh, cyclop. This is the lesser known one hundred millimeter f two, and I prefer this lens to the to the to the normal cyclop. And I put it on, and it produced a fantastic photo. 
Um, something that I just could not have got with any other lens. I'm, I'm convinced about that. I could have, I could have had another hundred millimeter lens with me, a hundred millimeter f two, like my my Olympus, which is an incredible lens, but it would not have produced the the image that this did. It gave a unique image, and part of that is because it's got it has some odd field curvature going on there. Um, it's got. <laughs> it's not even designed to have pictures taken with it so so a lot a lot of the design decisions that that perhaps designers go through to to make a, a taking lens for photography they didn't have to do any of those things but it didn't matter they weren't trying to reprodu reproduce um exactly what what the eye could see or anything like that it was just just a matter of uh, being able to detect uh, light uh, somewhere under under candlelight or something like that or, or moonlight and so on and so all of those things conspired to give a lens of enormous character or enormous flaws depending on how you want to look at it and and it just meant that I could just enjoy pointing it at almost anything relatively close and produce beautiful images wow nice so yeah, there it is, my my lens of the year, um, and it's I've used it on on film as well. I've adapted I adapted it to my contacts cameras. I'm not sure if I shot it on the AX. Or, in fact, I did. I shot it on the AX, and I've taken uh, a couple of studio shots with it, and I took another flower shot on film uh, on black, deliberate black and white shot, and it came out beautiful. Absolutely gorgeous. Even, you know, a bokeh shot on film, on black and white, and it's one of my favourite shots I've taken this year. Uh, and I think I took, a, I used another similar focal length. I think I used an 85 2.8 Sono to take the same subject, and it just, it was dull. It just didn't work. It was, it was, a, it was sort of the kind of shot that you expect to get if you take a black and white photograph with bokeh of a, of a flower, uh, whereas the, the 100 mil just delivered something special. Nice. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a neat lens. I'm I'm surprised that you've chosen that, but uh, it's a uh, it's definitely a fun lens. Yeah, no, yeah. I really really enjoy it, and uh, I've got one for sale on my eBay shop at the moment. For Luna. <laughs> 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 and uh, should you uh, navigate and buy that lens um, and send me a message to say that you've heard about it on the Classic Lenses podcast, I found the hood that goes with it that's not actually in any of the photographs or in the listing. So uh, if you if you do send me a note and say that I bought that lens, send me the hood. I'll send you the hood. So um, so there you go. Uh, my my lens of the year, the uh, Helios or Cyclop 100 millimeter f2. Wow. Johnny. Woo! Wow, this uh, this is turning into a very interesting uh, conversation. Um, and I've taken the 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 opportunity to expand my list. <laughs> From my original <laughs> three to eight, so uh, so there you go. You guys have been very inspirational here in my thinking. So um, <laughs> I, I, I've uh, my methodology is not nearly as good as, of course, either Perry or Simon's. Um, <laughs> but I, 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 I sort of roughly uh, thought of this as like an Oscars award. Um, kind of thing. And they do, in fairness, give a lot of kind of made up bullshit awards, right? So, I, yeah. I, I, yeah. And they the just like kind of come up with awards, I think, um, for particular people they want to give things to. So I may have done that a little bit too. Um, but yes, I've, I've loosely based my, my awards on, on the Oscars. So with that said, I'm going to, I will start with, uh, I don't know. Do you guys should I start with the top of the list or the work my way up from the bottom? Work your way up. Work your way up. Okay, great, great. Because this. Okay, so my <laughs> my first award uh, is going to be for um, best Soviet panorama camera designed by a weapons manufacturer. <laughs> 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 and, and then, of course, is going to be the uh, the KMZ FT two. Uh, famously de designed by uh, Fyodor Vasilevich Tokarev. Um, so uh, this is a very new to me camera. Santa just brought it last week. Apparently, he was listening to our show, uh, our program, and and brought me this camera. How ma can you imagine? That's incredible. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, the power of podcasting. Uh, the power of podcasting. Who says <laughs> there's no magic left in this world? 
Um, so I, I, in the very short time I've had this camera, um, I can tell that it is going to, well, I think it's, it's, it's the, basically the panorama experience I've really been after. Um, you know, I, I experiment with a lot of other panorama stuff, which we're going to still talk about, but there's something about this, which is in a completely different category um, for a lot of reasons. I mean, first of all, the negative size is just, it's insane. Um, it's 24 by 110. So it's essentially more than three full 35 millimeter frames kind of, you know, all butted up to each other. Um, so it's, it's a, it's a hugely wide, <laughs> hugely wide angle of view. Um, you don't even bother using the viewfinder. You just point it and level it because there's no, there's no point in using the viewfinder. It doesn't even cover a third of the area <laughs> that the camera covers. Um, so that's kind of interesting. Uh, so it's, it's really like this bizarre point and shoot, uh, panorama that takes in just an incredible amount of view because you know the other thing is that you've got a it's a 50 millimeter lens so you've got a normal lens but taking in this huge angle of view so it's it's i'm still wrapping my head around it um but in the 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 short amount of testing i've done with it um i'm already like looking around at all the stuff that i can sell to try to get another one of these (laughs) because i'm going to use this thing i'm going to use it like crazy because it's like it's exactly the sort of thing that i've been trying to do i mean that my my panorama ideal uh for the longest time um has been you know to do these extremely long and narrow panoramas of kind of like urban urban landscape kind of things Um, and I can finally do it with this camera and I can actually just put this camera in my bag without even thinking about going to any effort to carry it around. Cause it's as basically, it's as small as any of my other cameras. Um, so it, it, it does all the things I needed to do. It's easy to carry around and it, and it gives me the angle of view I've been looking for actually more. So I didn't even imagine having something that would cover this much area. So I'm, I'm really taken with this camera. Um, and I'm, I'm excited to get started with it. And for that reason, I think it deserves an award, even though I've had it for all of a week. Yeah, I, this is, I'd, I'd love to get hold of this. And, and I, you, the, the other advantage over something like the horizon is that you, you've got less chance of getting your feet in the shot as well. Yeah. Um, right. I mean, not that, not that the horizon's that wide in terms of height, uh, in the image, but there, there are plenty of times when I've used that and I'm thinking, yeah, this is fine, but I wish I was, it brought my subject matter a little bit closer. Because I've, I feel to get the most out of the horizon, you've got to get, well, it, for me, it works that yeah. I, I need to get quite close to what I'm after, which also then increases the distortion, which is yeah. fine uh, because that's what I like about the shots. But there are times where I'd, I'd, I would like to just get that slightly more conventional, but still super wide image. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. And, and, and the thing that I like about this is for true, like, you know, horizon panorama shots, like you're basically doing a shot at infinity of a distant landscape. You're, you're really not going to see any, um, distortion. It's going to, it's going to look completely undistorted, um, just as a function of, you know, the, the optics and the sort of the, that curved, uh, film plane. So it can be a really basically distortion free uh, kind of panorama look to it. And, and the other thing that's cool is it, it, just experimenting with it closer up. It's an F five lens. Um, and it, it, that's the other thing to be mentioned here. The lens is, it's just an in star 50. So it's a, it's a, you know, 53, what would be a 53.5, but it's throttled down to F five for a little more depth of field because it's, it's a focus free camera. It's just a point and shoot. It's, you know, yeah. there's no focusing to mess around with. And you, you have a lot of depth of field. Now the depth of field, it's, it's basically hyper focal from, um, 10 meters to infinity. So it's, it's made for things further away, but in the short amount of testing I've done with it, I really like how, people in the foreground let's say five to eight feet from the camera 
they're still enough in fo- they're pleasingly out of focus mm. right so so not distractingly so not not to the point where you say oh that looks that looks totally off they're a little bit out of focus but it totally works right and because the it's such a uh, long skinny angle of view if people are really close to the lens it chops their heads off and i love chopping heads off so <laughs> so i'm going to get a lot of head chopped photos of uh you know people crossing the street and that sort of thing which i'm all for that so i'm i'm really excited about my first uh, camera of the year again is the best soviet panorama camera by a former weapons designer which I'm, is the KMZ FT2 I'm just, I'm, I'm really intrigued by the potential of, uh, of less distortion. Um, yeah. I mean, certainly the horizon when you, when you, you, know, you got the bubble level, and if you shoot the horizontal um, and level with the ground, then whatever's level with you is not distorted. But yeah. even then, if something is above you or something is below you, and it's a horizontal line then that still gets distorted whether you like it or not. Right. And um, it's going to be interesting when you take some shots uh, to see what happens, uh, say, with some power lines, which I know you like your power lines. Yeah. Um, so it'd be interesting to see if it was, they'll be on a plane that's above you. Yeah. Uh, well, to see if they actually do have any distortion or just, y- just a small amount of distortion. Y- you know, it's interesting, and I, I, I read this. I, I, I was doing sort of a deep dive into, you know, I was doing like a Cheyenne-level deep dive into information on this camera, and I found this really interesting um, note that the lens, the way the lens is positioned in the camera, it's actually positioned slightly uh, upward so that even if your, even if your uh, horizon is – slightly up which if you think about it would be uh something you'd want in a lot of cases right it's still not going to distort because the the plane of focus is sort of angled slightly it's almost like a shift lens on the like a fixed shift lens on the camera to keep pan, to keep horizons flat even if the camera is not completely level and it's really interesting because I did a couple of tilted shots to try, to try that out. I, you know, where I, I got the camera leveled, but then flipped the bubble level up. So it was like to the front of the, you know, the little uh, pod there, the little round thingy. Mm-hmm. And, and, the, and the shots still look level and the, the horizons aren't distorted. And it's like, how the hell did it do that? So I, I you know, it's a wonder camera. What can I tell you? What is uh, Johnny? What does this shutter sound like? Uh, well, funny you should ask, Perry. Hold on one second, and you'll get to hear it. I'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm back with the camera, and I'm gonna I'm gonna wind and fire this camera so you can hear it. I'll do it at uh, the slower speed, and then I'll do it at the fast speed because it's it's because it's really impressive with fast speed. So. That was the winding, which doesn't sound like much. Here's the firing. Oh, so it's okay. Yeah, it's it's no louder than basically an SLR. That's it's, way better than the Horizon. Yeah, it's no louder than an SLR. Now, Perry, this one you'll enjoy. This is at the highest speed, which is a 400th of a second. Um, so it goes from being a quiet little camera to... <laughs> It's no, uh, it's not quite uh, on the level of your Bronica S2, but it's got a pretty good slap to it. It's not too bad. It's not too bad. It's not too mm-hmm. bad. It's got a decent slap to it, though. Enough so where if I set this on the table here and push the shutter speed, when the lens stops, the whole camera moves. <laughs> the, the the momentum of the lens carries the the camera uh, you know through, oh through it's the, the yeah the it's the same with the horizon it when it, the lens hits the end it like vibrates the whole camera yeah yeah, yeah it's pretty funny yeah. sorry wh- while we're on the subject of weird soviet swinging lens cameras simon i have a question for you about the horizon mm-hmm. um i don't know if this is by design or if mine is just screwy but i found that with mine if i have a cable release in it uh and it's screwed in all the way a, it loosens the shutter button, but B, the shutter stops caulking. So you can advance the film, but it won't caulk the shutter if there's a cable release screwed all the way into the shutter button. Have mm. you tried that? Mm. No, I've, I've not. And I, I've got a roll of film in there as well at the moment. So 
it's gonna have to wait before I get a chance to do that. But if I if I remember, I'll I'll take it out with the cable release and just give it a go, see if mine behaves any differently. But I guess it'll be the same as yours. Okay, cool. All right. Okay, mo- moving on. Um, I'm gonna continue the uh, the theme here a little bit. Um, uh, because my next award is going to go to uh, best fixed lens point and shoot panorama camera, um, and this, of course, is going to be the Minolta Riva Panorama, which has a twenty four millimeter f four point five lens. Um, and I, I've just in the past uh, month or so here have gotten through my entire backlog of C forty one developing, which was about sixty rolls. And the biggest offender in that bag of undeveloped film was by far the Riva Panorama. Um, because it's so easy to just shoot the shit out of this camera and and blow through a roll of film. So, I, you know, I've tried to be more mindful of how much I'm shooting on that camera because I have a lot of just, you know, ridiculous pictures, um, rolls and rolls and rolls of uh, shots from moving cars on highways, et cetera, et cetera. So I've tried to be a little bit more, uh, you know, slow it down a little bit, but that camera just continues to amaze me. And it, it it's still in my bag every single day. So I want to give an award to um, the Riva Panorama, uh, Pocket Panavision, Poor Man's X-Pan, call it what you will. Um, it continues to be amazing. It's a it's a nice pocketable camera. There's no two ways about that. Yeah, um, I've I've now shot a roll through it, and uh, it's now gone back to back to Hamish, uh, where it belongs. Uh, but I've not developed the roll yet. Hopefully, that's going to happen in the new year. Um, yeah, because so I think on the seventh, I think we're going to be doing C forty one at the Six Towns Dark Room. Ah, hey, hey very good. <laughs> so, uh, along with some uh, Remjet stuff as well. I don't know if we're going to do the Remjet, Remjet stuff after we've done the good stuff. I don't know. We'll see. Um, <laughs> but yeah, looking forward to seeing the shots on that. Although, as I said before, that was the one that gave me my realization that just cropping uh, a view doesn't really feel like panorama to me. It's more panavision. Yeah, that's what you call it in there. Your panavision yeah. camera. Kind of yeah. Yep. All right. So there's, there's that one. Um, I'm going to give another award uh, to maybe an unexpected or unheralded somewhat camera, but it's a, it's a camera I continue to use on a regular basis um, that I have now had. I bought this camera in 2012. So I've been using this camera more or less, there are times when I don't use it as much, but I, I, I still go back to it and it still um, it still brings me a lot of joy. And it's digital, Ricardo. <laughs> so the the Ricardo Bayon Digital Camera of the Year award goes to the Fuji X one hundred S with nice. the Fu- Fujinon Super EBC twenty three millimeter f two. Uh, so I used this camera a lot when I was on that recent short trip to California. And it, it, this is usually what happens is I, 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 I think, wow, that would make sense to, to shoot that. I'll shoot that. And then I start shooting it a lot again. It's like I, it's like I just keep coming back to it when I want to actually do some things in digital that are just way easier to do than they are on film. Yeah. Um, and so for purely for the, you know, the convenience and ease of, uh, being able to shoot digital, but in a on a camera that actually feels like a real camera, it 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 keeps bringing me a lot of happiness for that reason. So if I had a newer one, like if I had a brand new X one hundred F or something, you know the the award might be for uh, it might feel a little bit different. Well, I guess not. I mean, I just gave an award to a sixty year old panoramic camera, so it doesn't matter, right? Um. But yeah, that that's gonna that's gonna get. I guess because it's digital, I don't. You know, digital cameras are so. Uh, Say it. Well, they just. I mean, they're 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 so ephemeral because they don't last, right? I mean, it's, yeah, yeah. You know, it's a. I'm sure your digital camera from 2012 is kind of ridiculous, but it still does something really, really well, right? I mean, if it was like a, if it was like a. 
a Nikon D90 or something, it would just be that would just be stupid to give it an award. Um, but but that camera is it, it its core ethos is still it's still really remarkable to me. The X100 line is still really remarkable to me, and I think it's a well it well deserves its award. Yeah, totally. I think it's the most enjoyable digital camera uh, ever made. I mean, when I had my X100T, it was my favorite camera by favorite digital camera by country mile because it's yeah. such a joy to use. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think there's something that was said about using older older digital cameras anyway, and I'm I'm sure there are going to be people that in the future will go back to them for for some kind of je ne sais quoi that they they have. Um, uh huh. I know that I I still feel quite fondly towards the Fuji S5 uh, digital uh, camera. Digital. Uh, oh yeah. Um, yeah. And that, that those are nice. Yeah, that was a that was a CCD sensor, a Fuji sensor, um, made by Fuji as well, I think, and. That was that was just, it. Just took really really sweet pictures. I think I was based off the D two hundred, I think, or D two hundred S, something like yeah. that. Mm-hmm. It was the last the last of last of the line of the uh, the Fuji uh, Nikon DSLRs. But yeah. yeah, it produced images that were particularly nice. So yeah, you know, in the same way as we like the character of some older lenses, people I'm sure are going to go back to the character of some older digital cameras when they realise that you don't need fifty megapixels to take a photograph yeah. anymore. You know, and just, right. just go with something that looks good and be and be happy with that. Yeah, yeah the, only, I mean, the only problem will be nobody will be able to get batteries. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, it, 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 it's it's he's right though. You know, the only DSLR I still own is my original Canon 5D Classic, and I have a real soft spot for that. Yeah, yeah, I still have my 20D. Nice. <laughs> yeah, I had two of those. Yeah, yeah, it's still a great camera. They, it's like they the, those early on DSLRs when they were. It, like it was a new market and they were, and Canon and Nikon were just going to destroy each other to try to get the market share. They actually built them well. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like before they started with all the bullshit of, Oh, you can just adjust that focus yourself user. <laughs> yeah. We don't need to do that at the factory. You could just fine tune it for each lens and try oh, to figure out yeah. why your shots aren't in focus ever. I mean, the one D Mark three is where all of, of that crap. started going down. Yeah. There. What a load of crap. What a load of garbage. You know, so and and it's really funny how those older cameras like I see D80s and D90s all the time at the shop that are still working. They just keep and and those freaking Nikon users are just going to use them forever because they're cheap bastards. Nikon users are the cheapest bastards in the camera world. They will just (laughs) use their shit forever. And then they're going to get a brand new mirrorless Nikon Z camera and use their crappy lenses that they got with their D90 on that brand new camera. Why? Because they're too cheap to buy new ones. Well, that and Nikon doesn't make any lenses for it, but you know. So my (laughs) honorary rant of the friggin' year goes to the Nikon frickin' D90. There you go. Okay, getting back to more important things. Um, my, my award for medium format camera of the year is going to go to the Boit, Voigtlander Bessa 1 uh, Scope R 6x9. Mm-hmm. Um, and I have to say, I, I, really, I really love this camera. And the reason I like it is, is it has a feature that I feel um, makes folding cameras generally a pain in the butt to use and that feature is that unless the film winding is interlinked with the shutter advance or with the shutter essentially well yeah not not even that it doesn't even need to be interlinked well it but it is on this one but just the fact that 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 you don't have to screw around with the red window and you don't have to remember if the camera is cocked or not because uh-huh. it's not going to fire if it's not cocked. I, to me, like I, when I carry around a folding camera, I am constantly trying to remember if the damn camera is cocked or not. And then it's like, well, do you cock it immediately after you shoot it so you know that it's always cocked? But then if you do, you've advanced the film, and now you're going to get slack in the film if it has been wound too long and it might not have as the flatness might not be as good, blah, blah, blah. You don't have to worry about this with this camera. You can just you can wind it on right before you shoot it because you're gonna know it's got an interlock. 
And to me, it makes it on a, from a usability standpoint, it makes it a really enjoyable camera to use because your brain, you're spending no brain power on a stupid question. Is this camera cocked or not? Oh, you're, oh my God, you're so right. The number of shots I've missed on my folding cameras. My, oh, the my, number my of me- double exposures. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Right? I mean, yeah. it's like no, never fails. If I use a camera like that without that interlink, I'm going to have at least one shot per roll that I've double exposed. And it's always the shot that I think probably would have come out the best if it was not double exposed. So there's one folding camera I have that has not an interlock, but it has a mechanism for dealing with that. Yeah. Um, my Mamiya 6. Yes. Oh, that's yeah. a great camera. So I used to have two of these. I still have one left. Uh, it has an Olympus lens, which isn't the best. Um, but th- this one, it well, when you fire the shutter, um, you still have to cock it manually. But after you fire the shutter, a little red flag appears in the viewfinder. Yeah. And right. that red flag basically means don't take another picture. That's You've great. already exposed the frame. And then yeah. you have to pull a little lever before you can advance the film to the next uh, that's, to the next frame. That's beautiful. So it's, yeah, it's just a nice little fail safe to like, you know, you take a shot, you put it in your bag, you wait a while before you take the next shot and you have a, just a nice, like, don't be an idiot reminder in the right. viewfinder. Right. Right. right? That's it's, very it's really nice. nice. I, that it's great user design. Great user design. Yeah. Much appreciated. Okay. Moving on from the Voigtlander best of one medium format camera, my medium format camera of the year. Um, I'm going to give, this is a, one of those, I, I guess they call these like the, you know, the honorary Oscars that they give to someone that they just really like. So they mm-hmm. make up, they make up an honorary award. Um, th- this would be the, the, you know, the Carl award for sure for me, because this is Carl's lens. This is the Voigtlander Nocton classic SC 40 millimeter 1.4. Um, which I, you know, I, I can't, again, say how grateful I am to have this lens uh, because it obviously it was in, you know, Carl's hands. Um, and that's a wonderful thing. But also in the fact that it's, you know, it, it the 40 millimeter thing is now really become a thing for me. And I'm really enjoying 40 millimeter on the range finder. So it you know, to me, it was a really b- big deal to, to have this lens and for a lot of reasons. Um, it also, it also led me to get my first, uh, M M body camera, my M mount, my first M mount camera, which is the, um, the really, uh, 35 RF. So I would not have that camera if it was not for this lens and I would not be shooting 40 millimeter if it was not for this lens. Um, and obviously it was Carl's. So it, you know, there's a, there's a lot there. There's a lot of mm-hmm. a, emotional and um, also creative uh, goodwill and good feeling about this lens. So I, I'm, it's the lens that I'm, I'm, I'm just very grateful to have and are very happy to have. So that's great. Honor, so it's not, not a lens that we've talked about. This is not a lens I'm going to use every single day. I don't want to carry it around every day, but I'm really glad to have it. So that's going to get an honorary honorary carl award i guess we're calling it a carl which is fitting yeah okay moving moving right along um i'm gonna call this and and uh well i'm gonna call this the best new to me lens um and this follows right along with the 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 carl uh 40 millimeter this is the minolta emrocore 40 millimeter f2 Mm. Paired with the Roly 35 RF. So this is now my kind of daily um, carry around camera. Or it will be when I finally get the rangefinder fixed because somebody didn't do a very good job fixing it. Did you, Cam Request? <laughs> <laughs> Not to name any names. So I still need to get it. I think, Perry, I'm just going to send this to you in Hong Kong. <laughs> sure, and let's let me... and, and let some some uh, some professional sort it out there because I don't know anyone if I'm even going to get this like sorted here in the U.S. Or you know what I might, Perry. I you've told me that you've uh, you've redone your horizontal, yeah, a lot on right? my Bessa R. Yeah, no, it's not too bad, right? You said oh, it's really it's really easy. 
Okay, so maybe I just got to have you talk me through it because that's really the only reason I'm. It's not the end of the world. Like one of the the top frame line is a little crooked, but I can live with that. I don't. That doesn't bother me. But the the rangefinder being off horizontal really really bothers me. So you got to yeah. talk me through. You got to talk it through me through. You got to talk me through it, pal. That's. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if it's anything like the Bessa R, all you got to do is pop the hot shoe off. Yeah. Uh, and there's a screw underneath that you just turn. Okay. Yeah. All right. So you don't have to take anything apart. It's literally right underneath the hot shoe. It sounds like maybe even I can do that and not screw it up. It's very, very straightforward. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. So we've only got two left here, kids. We're getting really close to the end. Um, so my my best supporting lens... This is going to go to my much, much like Perry's. What did you call it, Perry? Your best, your the um, player of the year, not the player of the year. You know, they're the most dependable, the most dependable player award or whatever, right? Uh-huh. Um, this is the Canon LTM thirty-five millimeter f two. Mm. Um, and yeah. the camera I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pair this with is the Bessa R, the blue Bessa R, a.k.a. the Batman Bessa. That has been, if I look back on the past year, that has been by far my most dependable camera lens combo. Um, And my favorite in a lot of ways. It's lightweight. um, The rangefinder I love. I love the handling of the Bessa. Um... And the lens just doesn't let you down. It just, it, it just, it never lets you down. And like you said, Perry, about the Simicron M, the the F two has is just so useful on a thirty five. It's so useful when the light is just a little bit lower. Yeah. Um, where if you had a two point eight lens on there would work, but you'd be shooting wide open all the time. And you know, it's always nice to stop down a hair. Um, so it, it's the 35 F2 is just to me, it could be just the perfect all around do everything lens. Um, and certainly the Canon, you know, LTM 35 F2 is, it, it's just my best go to lens at that focal length. That's a good choice. I mean, that, that lens, that exact same lens lives on that exact same camera in my, uh, in my collection. Wow, Canon 35 f2 on the Bessa R because wow. there's something about you know it's weird but like the feel of a lens on a camera matters right yeah it's and just a, right <laughs> yeah there's a there's a similarity in the the finish as well yeah that's true yeah uh, the whole thing just kind of it just goes together it all goes together really well it, even even it's funny because that there's that um uh what is it 35 f2 voigtlander lens that pancake i mean Uh, the the 2.5 2.5 yeah the 2.5 i mean i really think that that was pretty much modeled on the canon ltm 35 f2 in a lot of ways i mean the the focus throw is short the size is similar it's it's Mm. very similar in a lot of ways and you figure the 2.5 because it's just a more modern lens is totally usable wide open in a way that probably the canon ltm you're going to probably shoot it a hair off of F2 just so it's not wide open all the time. So you're basically shooting it at just under 2.8 or at 2.8. So it's it's pretty much a dead ringer to me, usability-wise, in a, in a lot of ways. Although I find that lens, that lens, it's just so just enough smaller that it is a little bit difficult to use, whereas the, mm-hmm. the Canon 35 F2 is just it's kind of perfect. Yeah, I, I find the tab on the scope bar a little bit too small as well. Yeah. 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 So, or I mean, the pancake one doesn't even have a tab. It's just tab less. So it's, you know, it's so, the ring oh, yeah. is so small that it's hard to actually get a hold of it. So, yeah. Anyway, Canon LTM 35F2, best supporting lens for 2019. So this brings us to the my lens of the year. Um, so this is lens of the year slash best actor, I guess you would say. Um, and I'm using actor in a genderless way because <laughs> actress is sort of a silly term. So, um, just 
best actor slash lens of the year is the Voigtlander Color Scope R 21 millimeter f4 on the Ooh. Bessa L with the Minolta Panorama adapter. So it's basically that panoramaed out version of the Bessa L and the 21 millimeter in panoramic view. And nice. and that that's that's much much the way that um, uh, Simon with the Cyclop it, it the lens that. Um, changed your thinking or was inspirational a certain way to me that's what this has been because i've dicked around with so many different kind of panorama combos and so forth trying to get something that i really liked and you know i was experimenting with a lot of different lenses on um a lot of different cameras and but what i really really wanted was you know the bessa l to be a panorama camera and I got that when I figured out I could use that Minolta Panorama adapter. And then it was a matter of, well, I really like the 24 millimeter on the Minolta Riva Panorama, my best panorama point and shoot of the year. Uh, but, you know, uh, on a, uh, a lens that's going to be just a little bit wider, right? I was, I was really wanting something just a hair wider and also just on a camera that I actually had some control over. Um, and to my mind on this sort of crop 35 uh the 21 millimeter is just perfect because i've tried it with 15 millimeter i've tried it with 17 millimeter and those are just so crazy wide that it's hard to it's really hard to compose but the 21 millimeter on that sort of crop panel um it, it's like in that panorama ratio which is is that like what is that two point something to one I think. Um, what is it, Perry? Do you do you remember? On on what? It's it's like two point six. It's basically Panavision. It's like yeah, two, yeah, yeah. two point six to one, almost three to one. Yes, close to three to one. It so in that aspect ratio for me, the twenty one millimeter is like absolutely perfect. It's not. There's never a time I'm like, oh, if this was just a little bit wider, or oh, if this was just a little bit closer. It's like it's so. It, it's just so natural. So to me, it's become like the perfect combination of, you know, everything that I want in an easy to use uh, panorama camera, but with a little bit more control. Um, and I, and I, you know, and I'm an unabashed fan of the Bessa L. I, I love that camera for its small size. It's lightweight. You know, again, I am nothing ultimately. I'm not a, even a photographer. I'm a commuter with a camera. I'm a pedestrian with a camera, right? And and to me, it's it's such a good pedestrian camera because I can carry it in a bag with another camera and it's lightweight and it's small mm-hmm. and it's easy. And um, so this lens to me has just been the thing that's inspired me the most this year in terms of making images. So I want to give that camera lens combo my lens slash lens and camera of the year slash best actor as you will nice i was uh i was gonna put that lens on my awards list as well really um but i didn't have a best supporting lens category because it's (laughs) it's one that i always carry in my bag yeah yeah not for pano shooting just for general ultra wide yeah sure Uh, sure yeah because it's rangefinder coupled rangefinder coupled yeah 21 millimeters I mean, you have you have previously maligned this lens. I I have a little bit, and only because I find that like the fifteen millimeter, like the super wide Heliar, has just it's got a, a certain amount of um, I guess like pop to it that I feel like is somewhat lacking with the twenty one millimeter. I mean, maybe it's my copy too. It's my, I don't have a pristine copy of it. But I don't think that the marks on the, uh, that I know are on my glass are enough to detract that much from yeah. it. But I do, I do think the rend- – okay, so, so okay, I'm going to revise this slightly. This is Best Camera Lens and Film Award of the Year because <laughs> that's the other factor that I really haven't mentioned um, is that when, I've pa- when I paired – well, okay, so this lens, I feel like when you crop away the top and bottom, 
in that aspect ratio. I just, it feels extremely natural. Kind of like Perry, you were saying about how natural your X pan feels. Like mm. it's just a natural way of seeing that's how I feel about this combo as well. Um, but the thing that, that lens, it kind of put me off a little bit at times was I feel like it's got a, a contrast to it that is a little bit flatter through the mid tones and it does, it just doesn't have quite as much pop as some of the other Voigtlander lenses I've used. But when I pair it with um, Ilford XP2 Super, it's got exactly the contrast and the look that I want. So pairing it up with the XP2 Super is really the, became like the magic, brought the magic for it. Because it, you know, there's, there's still some grain, but it's like you look at these cropped 35s and you don't, the first thing you notice isn't grain. And I don't mind grain, but I don't want it to be with these panorama shots. The first thing that you notice about the shot. Mm -hmm. So I've been like toying around with the idea of shooting uh, T Max. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Instead of instead of uh, XP two, so I don't have to use C forty one chemistry. Um, but man, the the the, the XP two is just so flexible with different types of lighting, and you know. Um, uh, T Max is going to be a little bit fussier, so it's yeah, I'm, it's just, in a lot of ways, it's just a, a perfect combination of all factors that just works really well together. Yeah, I mean, it. I know what you mean about its rendering. Um, you know, the 15 millimeter super wide heliar that I also have. I think it the results look a little nicer. Yeah. Um, but the 21 is. I, I just find it more versatile. Yeah. Uh, right. The Partly because of the rangefinder coupling, but also because of the handling and the fact that it's not a scale focused lens. Right, right. Well, um, I mean, just, and I, but you know, obviously, I'm only shooting at scale focus, which is right because it's best L. Yeah, right. But if I wanted to shoot it coupled, I could shoot coupled focused 21 millimeter yeah. on, say, my best R with the same panorama adapter. Right. Right. There's the um, versatility. Yeah. Yeah. I, exactly. I use mine on on my Fuji as much as I do on a Leica. Okay, that makes sense too. Yeah, yeah. It's a really good. It's a really good focal length on a Fuji. Yeah, yeah. It's like what, like a forty millimeter ish. Yeah, ish with a with a yeah. nice focus tab. Yeah, good size. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, well, that was it. That was my my lens, camera, film, and uh, and panorama adapter of the year award. <laughs> nice, and I like that. I like how all of us have put panoramic cameras. Uh, it's just like the year of the award. panorama. It certainly has. Do, oh, yeah. Do we all agree on this? It was yeah. the year of the pa- wow. The year of the panorama. Nice. And and we've all ultimately gone for different kinds of panorama cameras as well. This is true. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Perry, is there like in the, uh, uh, I don't know, in in the in the Chinese calendar, is there a um, – is there a is, you know how they have like the year of the yeah. dragon and so is there like a is there is there one of those that lends itself well to being a panorama? Is there a panoramic figure in the any any of that? Like a well, panoramic guess, rat or something? I guess the what? dragon would be the longest. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> or we could just add a year of the panorama. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Although <laughs> although cool trivia about the Chinese zodiac. Um, there is a legend uh, that explains why the cat is not on the Chinese Zodiac. Really? Um, because the whole idea behind it was like all of the animals, they were doing some kind of race um, to to like the emperor or something. Um, and there's various lore about how all of them crossed a river to, to finish the race to get to the emperor. Uh, but then the cat, who is also supposed to be part of the race, just didn't give a shit and fell asleep. <laughs> oh, that's why there's no year of the cat that's excellent <laughs> oh that's really good uh totally in character as well uh yeah that's awesome well all right the year of the panorama wow yes it is it is and uh all right i would <laughs> I've, I've, I'm actually just going to sneak one little award on on the end of that one. See, I've, 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 I've given few awards out than anybody has today, um, <laughs> so I'll, I'll just I'm going to sneak sneak one in there, and um, and that is um, the award for the uh, currently uh, on Kickstarter camera panoramic camera. Uh, oh yeah, called, called a Branco Pan 
Award of 2019, which hopefully is going to become a reality in 2020. Um, and uh, there are 11 days left of that uh, Kickstarter. And where are we at? Uh, we're at 73%. So it, it slowed down. It slowed down. Um, so we need, uh, we've got 11 days to go. So you can, you can back it for a dollar and you'll get the plans. So you can just go in for 3D print it or you can uh, give a, a bigger thank you to Ethan and uh, go with one of the, uh, one of the other options on there, such as the one I've done, which is, um, I think it's $40 or $50. I can't remember, which ultimately you're just going to get a, a, a laser cut plastic dial that st sits on the top of your camera to make it look a little bit nicer. But I think that's a good way to say thanks to Ethan for putting the amount of time that he has done in, in, into the, into that device. So, uh, hopefully the, uh, the remaining 27%, uh, that's to go in the next 11 days will, will, will be reached. Um, and that, that will be released to everybody that, uh, backs it in January. Um, so if you go onto a Kickstarter and look up Branco pan, that's all you need to type in there. Branco pan, all one word, and, uh, you'll get a link to Ethan's, uh, camera, which you can hopefully be able to download the plans and just build it yourself on either yours or your friends or somebody's 3d Simon's. printer outstanding nice yeah hey it's the year of the pano is one of the cheapest ways to do it it is it is yeah yeah, yeah. potentially you could get this well i mean not you've still got to get yourself a, a lens for it which would be the most the most expensive part of it but we like buying lenses don't we um and that's the uh <laughs> Any of the Mamiya press lenses, universal lenses, uh, will go on it. I've got the 50 millimeter, which is a uh, biotar. No, 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 biogon design. And there's a there's a 100 millimeter f 2.8 biotar design out there as well. Um, although you're only going to be able to use it at scale focus, so you won't see these wonderful photographs until you've actually done it. And of course, you've got to set your uh, your range finder. You probably need one of those clip-on range finders to get the most out of that at shooting at 2.8 on a 100 millimeter lens. But that's that sounds good to me. I, I really really like the idea of doing this, and it's shooting it with a with 35 millimeter film. So it's I think it's the same format as the uh, is the X pan. So who needs an X pan? Get a Branco pan. Or get an expand. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I I think this is a good time to start closing things down. Um, I think that's we've we've got a a, a pretty diverse uh, array of awards that have been given out tonight to some cameras I'd never would have or lenses of that I wouldn't have thought would have gotten an award tonight, and I'm sure that people think. Uh, the same kind of thing with my choices as well. Um, so, uh, so that was good fun. Um, have we got any shout outs that we want to do? And I'll go to Johnny first. I have a couple. Um, I want to give one shout out, out to Richard Swift, who stopped by central camera the other day. Um, it was really cool to, it was so busy. It was on a, I think it was, uh, what was it like a fr Friday? Anyway, it was just it was really busy this week with the holiday and post holiday, um, but I had a chance to, to briefly talk to Richard Swift. He was he was in town um, and stopped by Central Camera, and it was really cool to to meet with meet him and chat with him real quick. And I want to give a, a, a special uh, shout out to uh, Hong Jun Lee, who is a regular at Central Camera, a regular listener here of the podcast, and he is a new member of the Canon P Army. We we inspired oh, him. To, yeah, we inspired him to get a Canon P based on the conversations here, um, and also I was going to say nothing to do with anything I've said. Then no, no, definitely not. <laughs> I've been ignored uh, on that one. <laughs> <laughs> He's listened to the the you know the wiser heads of the podcast regarding the Canon P, um, it, but he also has for the for this camera he recently picked up at Central Camera. We had a. Uh, Nippon Kogaku, the Nikkor uh, HC, the 50, the 5 CM F2 sonar, uh, you know, the close focus, the classic heavy, heavy, heavy chrome uh, version of the sonar. Um, so he yeah. picked that, he picked that lens up, which is a, one of my very most favorite 50 millimeter lenses. Um, he picked that one up and he's really been enjoying that lens. And I mean, that thing is going to pair, it pairs really nicely with a canopy. So, um, so enjoy the keep enjoying the lens and enjoy the P when it arrives. 
and I'm I'm looking forward to seeing it soon. I'm sure you'll have it in the shop. Sweet. If uh, if anyone in Hong Kong wants a Canon P, by the way, mine is for sale. Ah. Oh. <laughs> are you, are you, so you're you're now you're you're deserting the Canon P army then? Is that the case, or would you just is this a spare camera that's going? Uh, I, I was never really part of the Canon P army. I bought it <laughs> and I didn't like it because I don't like the viewfinder. And then after I got the Canon 5L, uh, yeah, I, I I like that camera so much better. And it, it's pretty much the same camera with a it's different viewfinder. It's very similar. Yeah, yeah, they're yeah. very similar. So yeah. I have a different version that I like better. You heard it here, folks. You could own. Perry, the famous Perry with the classic lizard podcast. You could own his Canon P. That's Just right. Think of, put, let that let that sink in. <laughs> and I put at least one roll of film through it. Before, there you so go. You should get somebody should get Perry's Canon P. <laughs> um, was that was that was that two uh, shout outs you just that got was, was that, that was two that, that was my was, two, yeah yeah that was my two shout outs yeah okay i was just going to say on the on on the subject of uh, uh nippon kugaku is that what we're saying it is that what we're saying it kaga kugaku anyway yep. that one um i've just sold my 8.5 centimeter 85 millimeter f2 oh is now, is now gone wow um, which i was i was there thinking perhaps nobody will buy it and it'll just stay on the shelf uh, and, that, and that would have made me quite happy, but uh, but it has gone, and it's gone to uh, a chap that does uh, a blog called Mister Lyka. Uh, oh, Mister Lyka. Oh, as, nice as bought blog. It. So uh, so, mm. it, it sounds like I, I may actually see things happening with that lens uh, in the future. So that make me feel that's happy. cool. Yeah, that blog is a little. I don't think he listens to this podcast. I find that blog a little obnoxious. <laughs> Okay, well, well, he might he might start listening now because I I think I I put it on my uh, well whenever whenever I send something out it's it's got um, on my receipts it's got uh, the classic lenses podcast so, uh, so so Matt if you're listening uh, Perry didn't mean that take it up with Perry <laughs> yeah. oh, wait 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 sorry is this Matt Osborne uh, yes be. yes he will be yeah. Oh, okay, no, no, no. His his stuff is cool. I'm I'm thinking of someone else then. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, you're thinking of that. Uh, I I know who you're thinking of. Yeah, the the, the Eastern European dude. Yeah, that guy. Yeah. He's a dick. He's a dick. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad we cleared that one up. Anyway. <laughs> Matt, you're not a dick. We like you. Yeah. Okay. That's cool. um, uh, uh, Mike Mike Epstein just bought that lens today. Excellent. No, in no. Nikon S mount. I was going to say you didn't. Oh right, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. On F mount, I didn't know that it was. Up. It was no, no. Nick on S mount. Oh S. Oh, sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm with you. For his S three. Yeah. A beautiful lens. Absolutely gorgeous lens. No two ways about oh, yeah. it. I'm going to miss that. And it focuses in the right direction as well, which is another bonus for that being a nickel. Speaking um, of Nikkor lenses, by the way, mm -hmm. uh, Simon, while you were finishing up your awards, uh, I quietly went on eBay. And I've just purchased a Nikkor 35 uh, 2.8 perspective control lens and a Nikon 2 Hasselblad X fan adapter. Oh. Fantastic. So there we go. The whole buying a lens on eBay during the episode, it's it's happened. So they they <laughs> there's we need to name an, an award. This needs to be like like how do I don't we need to find the right wording for it, but there needs to be an award for people who are on the podcast who buy a lens during the podcast. And well, it's obvious, fitting to do it. Obviously in honor of Carl. It's fitting to do it during the Carls, but I think yes. What 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 you what we should do is if that happens in the future for Simon to just have like some kind of klaxon ready. Well, we did have uh, a bell once. Didn't we did have a bell, yeah. yeah. Yeah, oh, I, I, I tinkled something. I don't know. Yeah. If, well, this tinkle. <laughs> so. ah, that almost yeah, tinkles, there we go. It? Yeah, yeah. I might go. find something better than that next time. I don't know what I used last time. It was a while. Well, that 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 kind of works. Yeah, that's a that's a hood for a Tamron hundred <laughs> millimeter hundred millimeter f. Is it two point five? Don't don't see these things very often. Uh, I think it's a 100 two point, or is it a 105 2.5? It's a Tamron, one of the older, the older kinds. Well, there you go. Just a bit of trivia there. That'll be on eBay soon. Uh, <laughs> there you go. It's got fungus in it though, unfortunately. But there you go. Uh, it, it still works. Don't let fungus put you off. Um, right. Okay. Um, Perry, 
have you? I'm not sure if you've done shout outs or not. Uh, no, I got I got a ton. Okay. Um, okay. I I don't remember. I don't think I mentioned any from my trip to Bali. Uh, oh, so yeah. the the first thing there is a shout out to a guy whose name I don't remember. Um, but he was this this Asian dude from San Francisco. Uh, who was taking photographs and we bumped into him on the rice terraces up in the kind of middle south south middle of Bali and uh, he took a he, he was basically we took a photo of him and his wife and then he took a photo for my girlfriend uh, me and my girlfriend but then as he was doing this um, a he took a picture with my like a CL where he was like oh I haven't shot a film camera in ages this is cool and um he sounded like that, by the way. He had like an extreme southern drawl, <laughs> and and then he took my girlfriend's phone and started trying to use the pano uh, feature, you know, in the in the spirit of pano as a format of the year, and the iPhone just wouldn't do it. It kept squishing our faces, and so he stood there for a good fifteen minutes trying to get this to work, and he kept saying, "Why is this pano not working? It always works. It's making you guys look stupid. You look squished." And so my shout out is uh, not to him, but to his wife, uh, who stood there in the scorching sun, just watching her husband dick around with someone else's pano, <laughs> pano feature on the phone. Uh, so thank you very much for that. That was that was funny. Uh, my other shout outs go to people here in Hong Kong. Uh, the first is I've mentioned a few him a few times on this episode, but the first goes to Mr. Mike Epstein, um, with whom I woke up at five thirty in the morning to go to an abandoned village. Uh, and shoot. He was shooting some crazy stuff. He had an ISO 0.6 color film uh, that he was shooting. He was also shooting Imago oh, was, was 3. That, was that 2468? Kodak 2468? I don't know, but it makes me want to say, who do we appreciate? <laughs> <laughs> uh, he he posted it. Sorry, he posted it in the group. Um, let, me, let me look at it. I don't think it was Kodak 2468. But I know that when he brought it to the lab, they were super, super uh, excited. Oh, that's cool. I'm uh, not sure it if is six eight might be black and white actually, but there you go. It's a no, no. It's an ultra low ISO color film from the people at the Film Photography Project. Uh, ISO one point six. I don't yeah, know what it's called, but that's ultimately going to be something. You know what I mean? It They're is gonna, something. Yeah, as in the the, the FPP don't physically make their own yeah film. they will be taking it from something and, and cutting it down and popping it out so uh, um, there is for anybody interested in ultra low iso there's there's a uh, a podcast called the ultra low iso um club ulick uh podcast and uh, they've got five episodes out and i think they're just about to bring a number six out as well there's also a facebook group as well and um they've been using lots of different kind i think i think you're meant to be just shooting stuff under under ISO 25, and I'm waiting for the um, Michael Bartosek to uh, make up some two, Kodak two four six eight, uh, which is point six ISO, which is what made me think is is that the same? Uh, no, no, this, this is ISO one point six. Sorry, oh, 1. Right. oh, that's a bit fast. Yeah, oh, that's <laughs> yeah, that's just too that's just too easy. Um, so I'm, I'm the reason why I'm quite I'm quite excited about this was I'm hoping it will fit in fit in. I hope it will work with my Konica uh, FS1 camera. Um, the problem with this particular two four six eight stuff is it's sprocketless, so it can only actually cool. use it on a few different cameras. And I don't know if the Konica will work with it as well, especially with them being a motor wide as well. Um, but I just want to go out in the daylight, the middle of the day, in bright sunlight, and shoot with my Hexanon 57mm 1.2, <laughs> at 1.2 yeah. everywhere, and, and probably shooting at probably a 30th of a second on a, on a bright day. <laughs> I, I just just find the, the whole idea of doing that exciting and weird, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Um, wow, that... That well, sounds maybe, unnecessary and fun. Maybe, <laughs> you, you, maybe if you needed to, you could, you could push it to... What would that be? Uh, ASA 1.2? Oh, you got to push it to 1.2, so it's 1.2 at ISO 1.2. Yeah, but, but just oh, gr- oh, yeah. I'm not yeah. sure if I can cope with that excessive grain of a, of a 1.2 film. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm not sure about that. I uh, the dynamic range as well. The latitude is just going to go out, out the window, yeah. isn't it? The same Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, so that's a shout-out to Mike Epstein. Uh, we got some cool shots. 
I, I shot with my Bronica S2 on that shoot, and man, that Nikkor 75 28 lens on that camera is so good. Every time I shoot with it, it just blows me away. The funny thing was, I was shooting with the Bronica S2 and the Horizon, which are two of the most, two of the loudest cameras that I own. <laughs> Probably the two loudest cameras I own. So there, there were quite a few times when um, we were in an abandoned building and Epstein would be on the floor above. I'd be on the floor below. And then I would, f- <laughs> I'd be firing like a horizon shot. And I would just hear a shout from the floor above of him going, Perry, did you just take a photograph? <laughs> <laughs> wow. He, he maybe was keeping track of how many frames he'd shot. <laughs> yeah. Um, so th- that was fun. And then my last shout out goes uh, to a, uh, a few of my other friends. Um, Maggie, Kenneth, Max, and uh, Irene, who Maggie came with us to the abandoned uh, abandoned village as well, and she was responsible for filming our attempts at the Horizon running shots. Uh, but a couple of days before that, we went to another sort of abandoned waterside fortress in a different part of Hong Kong, and uh, this lady Irene was showing all of them how to shoot large format for the first time. So they were using a Wista field camera and essentially it took them two hours to take two photographs. Uh, but, but at one point when, when Maggie was trying to set up this camera, she unscrewed one of the little nuts. Uh, I don't know what they're called. You know, the bit of the front of the camera where you're adjusting it back and forth. Yeah. Yeah. On, on those rails. So the, one of those nuts, the, she the unsc- uh, at the, no, it, it was one of the nuts at the top. Oh, so you know the front of the camera. You've got the two wheels at the bottom that move it back and forth. Yeah, and then on the top, near the top of the lens board. Yeah, there's like two more screws that do something. So you're talking about something that's on on the front standard. Sure. So anyway, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I don't know what that's called. Um, but she managed to drop that nut, which was brass in color. Uh, into a pile of dry grass. Oh, no! Uh, <laughs> which was the same color. And so we spent a good 20 minutes digging through. It was literally finding like a needle in a haystack. Uh, but eventually, we did manage to find it. Um, so that was kind of fun, just watching just watching people attempt to shoot large format for the first time because it it's one of the most pointless things I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> <laughs> but but it's a very enriching experience and and i think everyone's excited to see those images yeah i i I've, I've, i feel i feel i need to defend large format here now um and get do a quick <laughs> shout out for the large format photography podcast uh, which i yes co- over to you co- for that. co-host with uh, andrew bartram um we've taken a, a short break at the moment we're gonna be back in the new year um so uh, we've done 20 episodes in in 2019 and uh they've been um, very enjoyable they are too um but you know large, large format though it's a case of yeah two two hours to take two photographs yeah that's it you could argue it's 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 excessive but there are plenty of people that shoot large format will actually go out for a weekend to take one particular shot and hopefully they'll get it and go home happy if they do yeah you know, it's it's a it's a it's a different it's just a different mindset shooting shooting large format it forces you to to think more because it takes you so much longer to actually set the camera up in a way that you're not going to mess your photograph up i mean there are just so many ways of breaking a photograph with large format so it it just take it it encourages you to take time and be methodical and ask yourself is this is this view really really worth it and most of the time the answer is no um, which also means that your keeper rate tends to be a lot higher uh, because you but you also do have the other side of it is that you never take any photographs at all because none of them are worth it. But you know you've got to find some balance in there. But uh, no, it's a it's just a different it's a different attitude and it is about the immersive experience of photography in, in my opinion. Mm. Yeah, I mean I, I'm being facetious, dismissing it. It was it was to me it was fun just watching them do it because. I was around shooting and, and just helping them with metering because I told them they should use an orange filter for one shot. So they it was like a building and they had me kind of climb, like go into the shadows, into the highlights and then climb to the second level and just, you know, meter on each of those and then do the calculations. But I think my favorite part of 
watching all of that was Maggie was so scared of damaging the camera that when she would emerge from that cape, what's it called? The the dark thing that you hide under the cloth. A uh, dark cloth. Oh, a dark cloth. Okay, cool. It's a pretty intuitive name. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> it, 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 instead of lifting the dark cloth over your head like you're supposed to, she would she would climb out from underneath it, <laughs> so kind of like crouch down and then <laughs> and crawl I, I did, on the floor away I, from the camera. I, I've got to say, I was looking at the the photos of that of the, that camera when it was in use, and the dark cloth was was being extended all, almost to the front lens. And I was yeah. thinking, that's what? Why? There's no need for that. Just it's <laughs> you know, it's, it, you know, you're not going to get light leaks or anything like that. You know, it's just so just to enable you to see the ground glass screen at the back, Pierre. Yeah, because uh, for anybody that doesn't quite understand that, um, it's a, a ground glass screen. You, when you look at one, and anybody that uses a, a DSLR or an SLR camera is looking at a ground glass ground glass screen. Um, but when you're doing that, most of the time it, it's shaded uh, uh, because it's a, you know, you're looking through a pentaprism and no extraneous light is getting in there. Even if you're looking at a, a waist level uh, uh, finder, which you're looking directly onto the glass, it's always in a hood uh, because the the light, the, the brightness of the of the image is not that bright. And if the, if you've got other light around, then it just washes it out. And the thing about using a large format camera is, generally speaking, the lenses are slower you know 4 4.5 is a pretty fast lens it's, well it is a fast lens on large format because also your focal lengths are, are considerably longer you know a, a mm-hmm. normal lens and a standard lens instead of being 50 millimeters about 150 millimeters yeah so you you're at, at longer focal lengths to start off with so it's a lot harder to make you know very fast uh lenses for large format because they just makes them huge um, so, so the image when it reaches the the ground glass is is appreciably darker, and therefore you need as much help as you can. And and the other thing is, uh, you tend to use um, some kind of magnification, uh, so a, fo- a focusing loop or something like that, uh, pressed against the glass just to actually make sure you're getting fine focus. Because sometimes you can't actually see the whole image uh, because the the uh, projected image at the at, at, in the corners. Uh, because you do get vignetting and things like that, you don't necessarily see them in the in the final image, but it, it makes it harder to actually see what's going on in the corner. So it's, and that's another reason why it slows you down because you, you've got to take a lot more care with the composition because some parts you're approximating and you've got to make sure you're going to get those things in. Mm. Yeah, there was one point where the dark cloth was almost swallowing the lens. Yeah. Uh, and they had to pull it back a little bit so that they could make a couple of adjustments. The lens, by the way, to keep it on topic... Uh, was a Rodenstock 150 millimeter f 5.6, yeah, um, and the film was Foma 320, four by five. 320. I didn't know there yes. was a 320. I know there's 400 and there's 200 and 100. I've heard of 320 before. Uh, that's what they told me it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Foma 320, yeah. the retro, the retro pan, the retro. Yeah, okay. yeah, in four by five. Cool. So, there we go. Okay. Uh, well, I think uh, I think we're done. Are we done? Did you have more shout-outs other than the large format photography uh, no, podcast? No, that that's just brought it forward. I guess ah, I know something I need to do because I didn't do it last week. So uh, mm. apologies, apologies uh, to those people that I didn't mention for supporting us last week because they did. And uh, they went to coffee.com, that's ko-fi.com, looked up Classic Lenses Podcast, and they sent us some money. Um, which is very, very nice of you. I just want to uh, let you know who those people were. Um, this, so this goes back to the 18th of December. Um, Nigel Cliff, again. Um, uh, Merry Christmas to you. And I thought, oh, this is my dyslexic brain collapsing around me already. Uh, Merry Christmas to you. And I think we will all be keeping Carl's family and friends and thoughts um uh, what must be a very difficult time for them in our thoughts uh, there you go and uh we certainly were and um yes i mean what what more can you say it must be a, a pretty horrible time of the year for uh, carl's family so um our thoughts are definitely yep. in that direction uh then we have uh christoph siegelin i think i've not 
trash your name too much. Uh, thank you for a great podcast uh, that you brought that you brought to new heights over the year. Even though I still hate you uh, for my occasional gas attacks, um, <laughs> um, we we now expect your best of, um, of obviously in a classy vinyl edition. Um, Merry Christmas. Um, then we have Paul Grief who. Uh, I think we, we thanked last week actually because he went to uh, that auction or he went online to the auction of uh, some of Carl's paintings and uh, photographs and he bought one uh, and he goes uh, hello gentlemen a cup of a cup of Door County Jingle Bell Java um, I think he may, have, <laughs> he may have listened to our theme music last week um, uh, for, each, for each of you uh, thank you for keeping me uh, company as I hibernate uh, develop film and repair derelict cameras this winter including a beauty canter 1.9 a Rolly B35 and a Minolta XE1 uh, love the show and happy Christmas and happy Christmas to you uh, Paul and uh, have a happy new year as well um, what's a beauty canter 1.9 does anybody know? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Those are those are unusual. Um, I tell you, they look almost. They look like they were came off the same assembly line with the um, uh, what do you call them? The um, hold on, it's going to come to me. Uh, the Petri one point nines. The the body styling is very similar. The body shape is very similar. I think, and there was a lot of collaboration between the Japanese makers at that time. I really suspect they were built all in the same place, or it, it, I, if not, they share such a remarkable similarity that um, th they just seem like they must be all related in some way. So, yeah, they're they're very nice cameras. They're very nice fixed lens rangefinders. All right, I've just uh, looked it up now. Yeah, I can, I can see the similarity. It actually looks quite similar as well to the uh, some of the Mamiya uh, fixed lens. Uh, yeah, cameras. I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. more, I'm thinking it seems more Mamiya like than it does. Uh, Petri well, to me, but to yeah, eyes. but it, if you look at the shaping of the body, the chassis, the way it's angled, it's it, it looks like it's literally the same body with slightly different styling. It's 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 incredibly similar. Right. Yeah. But it's not green matic though, is it? No, it's not green matic Nope, not yeah. green matic Yeah, it doesn't count. That's okay. Yeah. Uh, okay, so back to uh, back to coffee. So thank you, Paul. Uh, we had a donation from Mike Epstein again. Thank you, thank you, Mike, and uh, Barry Carr as well. Both of those have been recurring donations. So thank you very much for those. And then finally, uh, Charles Kirschenblatt, um, who says thanks and thanks to you, Charles. It's uh, most most welcome and uh it does help us out so uh so thank you all um okay that's that's pretty much it so wait uh, one, one more i yeah sorry i remembered i have one more shout out uh very quick one to mr mike novak uh because on sunday morning seven thirty a.m first thing my time he messages me and says this seems like a good price on this <laughs> uh, <laughs> and sends me a link to a uh, Agfa record six by nine, which I've been after for ages. Yeah, uh, and this is one with the nice Solinar lens, and it's sold by that seller on eBay, Certo Six. Oh yeah, uh, who I think is pr I don't know. I get the impression that he's one of the most trustworthy sellers of folders. Yeah, because um, he refurbishes them, he redoes the bellows, and he has this like hilarious disclaimer on all of his descriptions. <laughs> um so thank you mike uh he told me that he would have bought it himself but he's just picked up a uh fujika gs645w oh nice uh, yeah so he has left this one to me uh and so I wait you got right. that camera i thought so did you get that one yeah oh that's amazing yeah, yeah i got it right away after mike sent me the link as soon as i oh, saw it i took great. a look saw the seller saw the condition and uh and 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 put in an offer that was accepted right away. Wow. Well, well done, Mike. Thank you for that. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Mike Novak. I've been after this for ages and I can't wait to try it. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Um, right. Let's, let's finish off now. So how can people find you outside of this podcast, Perry? Uh, Instagram and Flickr. I am Perry G or you can go to my never updated website, perryg.com. Okay. And Johnny. 
Uh, you can catch up with me at Central Camera Company in Chicago uh, every day except for Sunday and Monday when I'm here doing the podcast. Okay. And ways of getting in touch with us. Getting in touch with us. You can get in touch with us uh, via email is the best way. If you want to send us a message, send it to classic lenses podcast at gmail.com. Um, you can of course visit the podcast central, which is the website, which is classic lenses podcast.com. Uh, all of the episodes live there. Um, you can watch the podcast. You can watch the podcast at, uh, on YouTube. So uh, sort of watch, sort of watch. Not you can watch really. the subtitles. Yes. You can watch the subtitles, uh, on YouTube. Uh, just look for the classic lenses podcast, YouTube channel. We soon to have, we soon will, to have yes. new and exciting new video. Yes. Yes. It will. We, 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 anybody who wants to know what Rick Mayo looks like when he's running as one of the characters in the young ones. <laughs> yes. Um, that will that will become apparent, and I still can't remember the name his, his, his character in it. I can remember the character he played before he did the Young Ones, which was Kevin Turvey. Um, but <laughs> I, for the life of me, I can't remember what it was called in the Young Ones. That's killing me. But there you go. Um, just the same anyway. And um, so, what if there are any people that listen to this show and they want to do something on Instagram? Well, you should definitely be following along with uh, Best Vintage Lens on Instagram. They have uh, cool photos there, shot with uh, vintage lenses, uh, classic lenses, every single day. So be sure to check that out. And be sure to read Ricardo's uh, almost weekly regular review of the podcast, which is better than the podcast itself. So be sure to check that out. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure. Yeah, I think don't think there's any actual doubt that he puts more effort into that than we. Oh yeah, he puts far more effort into it than than we do, especially me. So I mean, I read, I, I read it, and I was thinking, oh yeah, we did say that, didn't we? Yeah. <laughs> you know, if we, you know this, and this is like <laughs> days after it's gone out. So um, so yeah, he's 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 listening. I mean, he's listening now. Yeah, you know, he's listening to this now. He is taking notes. And, yeah. Uh, and then he's thinking of witty things to say back, and yeah. he does. He does. Yeah, he does. He does. So, thank you for that, yep. Ricardo. Yep. Thank you very much. Um, and do we have one other No, I thing? think we don't. Is that it? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, all right. Well, well, I should mention that we, I, I never meant to put it in the, in the show notes. Oh, but I, yes. Yes. I, I, I always feel the, the, I always, proud, not proud. Yes. Um, I always fail to mention that we are sponsored, not sponsored by Malort, Chicago's finest crappiest tastiest beverage yes. so there T- tastiest is quite accurate I'm pretty sure yeah about that. Yeah, yeah definitely tastiest <laughs> um, yeah and there's some of that is going to be winging its way over to us as well isn't it so uh, it yes. will yeah I've decided that um, I'm just going to not declare it as hazardous liquid and just send it to you guys yeah. and hopefully it gets through because apparently that's what people do i'm just gonna wrap it really well yeah so i mean you you could you could write on to say the uh, what it is on the outside in, in the hope that it will get stopped that's that's i could but i won't no. yeah. <laughs> yeah okay right well on on that note um for me um, I can be found outside of here on Twitter uh, as Simon4. I'm on Instagram as Simon Forster Photographic. Um, we have a Facebook group uh, dedicated to the podcast, which is the Classic Lenses Podcast Facebook group. And we also hang out in the Photography with Classic Lenses, the Facebook group that's that we were spawned from. Um, and uh, so that that's that's there, and it's got about I don't know how many multiple thousands of members that's got in. But we have a our, our small but perfectly formed group is much smaller, and um, and it's a nice place. So come along and uh, say hello to us there. If you do wish to join that group, by the way, do answer the question because if you don't, we might think that you're not going to be engaged enough, and therefore we won't let you in. So no. please, it's not, not hard to say something that will get you in. Um, so uh, please, please do that bit. Uh, so that's it. Um, our music 
uh, has gone back to um, our normal music supplier, uh, which is um, Kevin McLeod <laughs> <at> Competech.com. It's um, called Octo Blues, um, and didn't need bleep. Does not need bleeping ever. Um, the last time you ever get to choose the music, Perry. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, uh, which which actually that's that's a point. Um, if if anybody need, if anybody does actually go into the metadata for that episode, um, you will actually see the name that I had to because you, know, you have to <laughs> give, give full credit uh, for, for, to the author and uh, the name of the song and the name of that song is is in there. Um, I will say no more, uh, but you can find it if you go deep, looking deeply enough for it. Um, so uh, that's it. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this week's show, and if you can, be like Carl. <laughs> <laughs>